to another in conversation with in the In The Spotlight series of interviews. Thank you for agreeing to this interview so shortly after taking on your role as Deputy Grand Superintendent. September the 1st saw the start of the 2020-21 Sonic season and I am sure that you're hoping that the forthcoming season will not be interrupted in the same way as last year. I do appreciate that at the moment there can be no exaltations at the same time after many months of lockdown and social distancing many craft masons who are not in the Royal Arch will have considered their Masonic futures and what they want to do in Freemasonry. Many Masons consider the Royal Arch Ceremony of Exaltation to be the best ceremony in the Freemasonry and that one of the offices in particular has the best ritual of any degree. You are obviously a great enthusiast of this order, which is the completion of the third degree and therefore an extension of the craft, hence why there are so many overlaps. Before we find out more about at the Royal Arch, perhaps we can start off by finding out a little bit more about yourself. Where were you born? Um, my parents lived in Kent, um, in a little town called Westgate on Sea, uh, which to give you a little bit of context was uh, just down the road from Margate. And I was born at home. Delivered by midwives? I presume so, but it didn't really make much of a mark on me at the time. <laughs> Fair enough. Where were you raised? Well, uh, my parents uh, had a brief sojourn in High Wycombe, uh, but only for a couple of years, and then moved back to the Kent Coast again. Uh, this time to a town called Birchington on Sea, which was next door to Westgate, so back where they came from. And uh, they were there until my father retired and subsequently emigrated. Um, with his wife to South Africa. Uh, but I was sent away to boarding school, uh, so I did spend 10 years of my life partly in Sussex and partly in Surrey. So I had a, a little bit of everywhere um, you know, being raised, but I had the fortunate opportunity to return home occasionally at holiday time. Um, so I did have a little bit of everywhere. You went back to Hong Kong, presumably? Or South Africa, rather? Uh, no, my parents had never been to South Africa. Um, they wanted sunshine. Yeah. I think it was particularly gloomy winter or something. And they just wanted somewhere with a sunny climate. And uh, I think my mother was the driving force behind the decision. Uh, South Africa was still quite colonial, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and it had sunshine. So that's where they went and packed up and off they went, left me behind. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I was grown up by the way. What was your profession? Um, well, I'm now retired. Uh, both my wife Sue and I retired at the end of May last year. Uh, previously to that, I had had two careers. Uh, I started life as a salesman come account manager for um, food company, food business, um, and I spent my time going around the, the country selling a variety of different types of food, so I was in the frozen food business, um, selling young seafood, uh, I was a rep, you know, I sold beer, uh, I sold other snacks and things like this, so I did really well, I, I, I ate it through, but I didn't particularly like the job. Um, so I changed career uh, around my late 20s, and I became a financial advisor, and I spent my time working towards the corporate market. And I ended up with a small but influential group of corporate clients, and I advised them on their employee benefits for their staff. Fabulous people, uh, really great opportunity, very switched on, and these were clients of mine for 20 years. And then you just walked away from them? The time was right, I think. Yeah. Um, I obviously I had other people in the business who yeah. I would introduce to them and um, as one of them said you know it's basically it's the same horse it's just a different jockey um, so it didn't really leave too big a dent. So outside of your professional life uh, 
Uh, what are your interests outside of Freemasonry? Indeed, um, I have two, uh, predominantly. Um, one is basically food and drink. I love cookery. Um, I And cooking. And cooking. Yeah. Perhaps even my wife is also a very good cook, but uh, she tends to defer to my uh, knowledge and experience. And I, you are a chef. Uh, no, I think that's a bit over the top, but um, I'm an enthusiastic amateur. I, I, you know, I think that's perhaps as far as I would go. Um, but I do experiment with food. I take it as far as I possibly can. Uh, I'm not going to be a professional, but I do eat well. Um, I regret to say lockdown was not kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have put on weight, which I'm definitely trying to lose. Um, I enjoy good wine. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not over the top about it, but I just, if I'm going to drink a glass of wine, I want it to be really nice. And apart from that, <clears throat> um, I love music. Um, growing up in the family home, my parents were very uh, interested in classical music of all types, um, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I grew to love uh, classical music. But I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, so, you know, there was totally different stuff going on around me, which I also, uh, for my generation, loved. So they were chalk and cheese. And then I discovered jazz in my late teens, early 20s. And I didn't, I didn't like all of it, but there's some fabulous stuff. And I picked up on some of that. And I've always got something in the car that will lift my mood or calm me down or... But basically know. very Catholic tastes in music. Very much so, very much so. And there's always something on. Lovely. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to Freemasonry. Um, I thought we might. <laughs> <laughs> How and why did you become a Freemason? It's actually quite a long journey. Um, and I'm not sure how interesting it is, but it, it, I was aware of Freemasonry um, in my teens, because that was around the time of the Roberto Calvi affair. So, you know, you read about it. You know? I had no axe to grind with Freemasonry at all, but it wasn't something that you know, particularly bothered me. Um, but I moved into a, a, a flat in Ealing, and uh, you know, a couple of days after moving in, somebody banged on my door and said, do you, do you fancy coming to a round table meeting? And I'd never heard of round table, so I said, yeah, what's that? And he said, well, come along and find out. So I thought, well, nothing eventually, I'll go and do that. So I went to this round table meeting and walked into a room of 30 blokes who had pretty much the same sort of philosophy that Freemasonry has. Um, and they help people, they raise money for charity, uh, they were great fun to be with, and I became a member of the Ealing Round Table. Um, and I was there as a member for 20 years until they shut me out at 40, because it was a young man's organisation. But I knew that so many of the members of Ealing Roundtable were Freemasons. They made no secret of it. And they all said, oh, you know, you'll join and become Freemason. And I kept saying, okay, when can I do this? Um, but they kept putting me off. And I think possibly rightly, because I had progressed to uh, become the chairman of Ealing Roundtable. I'd moved on to uh, area chairman. I was area secretary for two years and I was National Councillor for Middlesex and Member of the Sports Committee. So actually, I don't think I could have done both. So they did actually do me a favour. But once that was done, and I, I'd done my tour of duty, um, I was invited to join Ealing Roundtable's closest connection, which was Roundtable Lodge at Middlesex. Um, and I loved it. And it's just perfect, because I was walking into a room full of people that I knew, uh, all had the same noble minds and warm hearts that you know we all want to bring that to me. So absolutely perfect for me. It took me a time. And is there still a connection between the round table? Are you still recruiting? Um, it, it's very sad, but round table was never a big organisation. I think in its peak there were probably what somewhere between thirty and thirty-five thousand members which is a good size, but it's not massive. Mm. And I think 
society's changed, uh, pressure of time, uh, work pressures certainly, and it's not disappeared totally, but it's a shadow of what it was. And in London, and particularly in Middlesex, there's not very much round table uh, left, I'm, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an issue for us in Round Table Lodge and also Round Table Chapter, um, because we had this ready source of material and, and that's dried up. Um, but we think the, the club mentality is pretty much what we're aiming for. If we can find perhaps Rotarians or those Lions members. Clubable people. Ab yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we're going through a bit of a dip and I think that's hardly surprising, but I hope in time we can turn that corner um, by just thinking slightly sideways and out of the box a bit. Yeah, yeah. So once into Freemasonry, who became your biggest influence? Gosh, that's really difficult. Um, I, I was very fortunate in that within Round Table Lodge there were a good many uh, Freemasons who worked hard at the ritual and worked hard at the ceremonial. Um, so I was driven by not wishing to be seen to fail. Um, but we had in our Lodge of Instruction two people uh, who were a significant um, influence on me. Um, one was very worshipful brother David Jeffrey, who has sadly passed to the Grand Lodge above. Um, but he was the preceptor for 20 odd years and he didn't let you off. You know, he very gently but forcefully he led you down the right route. And he made it that little bit easier for me because he had all the tips and the tricks to learning, which he was very free in sharing. Um, so I actually enjoyed it, and that is key, I think, to everything. Mm. Um, I should also mention that the deputy precept uh, preceptor was one um, right worshipful brother, Peter Baker, wasn't right worshipful at the time. But the thing about Peter, I took over from Peter as DC in the lodge. Oh, it's a formidable task. But the nice thing was, Peter would explain why and not just tell me what to do. So I had to think, and if I had a, you know, an issue with, we had a, a visiting right worshipful brother from Australia, and I've never had one of those, um, and I sat there and I thought, well, this is what I need to understand. I worked out what I thought I ought to do. Sent it to Peter, and I got this fabulous response that actually said, well, that's right, but that's wrong, and this is why, and this is how you do it, and this is why you do it. And I learned so much from both of them. But then I think when I first was fortunate enough to become a provincial steward, um, the provincial GDC was Stuart Rodenscroft at the time. And you know, what a fabulous guy he was. Uh, and he put so much effort into making sure we understood what we had to do in such a way that you wanted to please him. And, and that, to me, is a huge influence. And I suppose I'm going to beg a fourth, and that's John Cunning. I was his DC in the year before he became ill. And he taught me a lot about um, tolerance, I think, within orders where people can become quite intolerant if things aren't going right. And he taught me the most important thing is not getting the ritual right, not getting the ceremony right, but getting the meaning right. And I, I think I've had that for a long time through, you know, from various people. But I got it in spades from John, and he really made the Royal Arch come alive for me. Of course, sadly, no longer with us, but I, and I miss him a lot, and I know others do too. A lot of others do, yeah. yeah. What, in fact, does the Deputy Grand Superintendent do? Ah. And you may not be able to answer this. Well, when yes. we find out, can yes. I tell you? Yes. Um, there is clearly the obvious visibility role, um, and that is um, when we're allowed to do it again, uh, visiting the chapters within Middlesex on an official visit. Um, 
and also visiting other provinces at their AGM. Uh, and th these are opportunities for us to understand what's going on on the ground in, in our own province, what issues are happening elsewhere in other provinces, how do they overcome things. It's a melting pot of ideas and that's really useful for us. So that's, a, that's an easy bit to answer. What perhaps isn't so easy is the role is very much a, an administrative role and it's behind the scenes. Um, and that's what's so difficult to try and explain. Um, to give you an idea, when uh, Supreme Grand Chapter and the UGLE announced that we were restarting meetings, we had to provide guidance on how that would happen. And I know obviously ceremonial was uh, Jim Mitchell's provincial GDC's um, responsibility. He had the interview with you at the time. Um, for myself, it was working out the sort of frequently asked questions that we would expect to see and answering them before we had lots of people asking the same question. And of course, this had to be done in conjunction with the Deputy Provincial Grand Master, who is doing a very similar role, but for craft. And we had to work hand in glove to make sure that there were no mixed messages. Uh, the message when it went out, went out pretty much together, um, so that everyone understood that we were pulling in the right direction and we were all pulling in the same direction, no mixed messages. Um, and that, that's still going on. You know, here we are now with rule six, we're still doing that sort of guidance notes um, and all being well, we will have them finalised for the Royal Arch. Fingers crossed today, uh, they were uh, pretty nearly signed off. Uh, just the last I to dot and T to cross will be there. Um, so that's happening behind the scenes. Um, other parts of my role which are very easy are um, our visiting officers do a fabulous job. They spot people who they believe are worthy of uh, provincial rank or promotion and that is fed up through the assistance to the provincial grand principals, to the second principal, to my desk and then eventually the list is then forwarded on to Peter. So I'm putting that list together and making sure that it's accurate and we understand who the people are, what they might be uh, considered for as a, a, a rank and it's a huge responsibility to get that right. You know, I know nobody does it for provincial honours but my God, you have to get it right. Uh, so I have spent a long time during lockdown actually building the information together to make sure that when it is passed on, um, the most excellent grand superintendent will be able to look at a complete history of those individuals. In many ways, lockdown has uh, not only thrown you in at the deep end, but it has also come with support that you can, you've got the time to Absolutely. Having the time has, has been great, um, but what I'd have liked to have done is to sat around a table with everyone and say, how do I do this, guys? Um, and I, it hasn't been possible for obvious reasons. So, you know, you look at it, you understand, you think where you're aim aiming for, and then you have a telephone concert. It's not quite the same as sitting around having a coffee. <laughs> Why is it that craft masons uh, would want to join the Royal Arch. What is the, um, what's the attraction of the order? It, it, it's a good question. Um, and I could be really cheeky and turn it around and say, why wouldn't they? Um, but I, I'll, I'll illustrate it as best I can. Uh, I was with my family, um, my sister and her children, and we were having a, uh, a get together at my house a year or two back. And I, ex I, I was explaining what the Royal Arch was. And I was having to be very careful that I didn't describe anything that I wasn't allowed to. And I said, you know, our problem is that in the craft, we learn certain things, we go through a series of little playlists to, to illustrate certain things to ourselves. And in one of those, you learn that certain parts of our 
story become what? Due to the circumstances at the time. And the Royal Arch completes the journey, which starts with your initiation, because that's where you find out what those things were. And I think, well, what was the reaction to that? Well, my sister said, well, why on earth wouldn't anyone want to find out? It's like buying a novel and then stopping reading a couple of chapters before the end. I don't understand why people do that. It's a completion of your third degree. Third degree, yeah. So how, how time consuming is it? Um, at its basic, uh, a, a, a private chapter would expect to meet probably three times a year. Um, certainly most in Middlesex do. And on top of that, the, uh, there will be a chapter of instruction and um, that, if the chapter has one, we'll probably meet once a month with a break for um, you know, a period in the summer or whenever it's convenient. So not as time consuming as a craft mason might be used to? Well, it's on top of, so you have to bear that in mind. Uh, so if you belong to a single lodge that met, let's say, four times a year, you will now be meeting, if you join chapter, three additional times, so that's seven. Um, it's, I think a lot of people manage their lives differently today. I think it's doable. Uh, obviously there are many who go on to join lots of lodges, lots of chapters. Um, and I think part of our issue is there is a desperation almost to get somebody into a chapter. And I think some join because they make the connection and how important it is and, uh, and will do that for themselves. Others are properly mentored and are gently steered in that direction with their eyes open so they're not making any false moves. Uh, others will join simply because their mates have joined. Uh, and others regrettably join because a piece of paper is put in front of them and they're told to fill it in and sign it. And I, and I think once that happens, that's not actually helping the member to, uh, to get to know Royal Arch, to understand what it's about. And if, if, if we can get the mentoring right, then I think you know, we will have a lot more members. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to get to the chair? Again, a bit of a thorny issue this one because it's actually not that long. I, I think if you were to spend one year as steward and you went through all the other offices, you're actually at the door of the first of the chairs. Um, There's more know, than one chair. There are three chairs, yes. So you're at the beginning of that journey through three chairs in about five odd years, and that's really, really short. My belief is that somebody who joins Royal Arch, unless they really do want to progress rapidly, they should save for the moment. There's a lot to learn and understand from the ceremony of, of exaltation. And if they spend a little bit of time as part of the chapter without having huge responsibility thrust upon them, they will begin to understand what is actually quite a complex story. Um, and also the meaning behind it. I think sometimes uh, two things can happen. Uh, getting a new member is mission accomplished, and then they're left to fend for themselves. They, they do need mentoring. And the other is, <laughs> we've got a new member, we'll put him on the ladder straight away. Mm -hmm. And of course, that becomes hard because there is ritual to learn and ceremonial to learn too. And that makes it a chore. And if it's a chore, people won't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, we've got to build a, 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 a way where people who join are mentored, looked after, they only profess when they're ready to do so. There's no correct answer to my next question, uh, but in your experience, when do you think is the best time for a, someone to join the Royal Arch? In... Um, I'm going to say subject to finance and family and work, I ideally join at a point where you 
you're not looking at going through the check-in. If you can join before, that is great, because that then says, I have time before I want to progress in Royal Arch to work my way through craft and to take the chair and come out the other side, and then I'm in a position to decide, do I want to do more in craft? Do I want to do more in Royal Arch? And you're in a position to make an informed judgment. What happens, I think, sometimes is people are asked either far too early, uh, so immediately after they've done their third degree, here's a form. That doesn't help. I think sometimes um, people leave it and they're asked when they're going through the chair, they go, no, I've got far too much to do. I'll put it off. And then the moment is lost. Um, or they believe that they can just leave it and, you know, not bother. And I, I think that, I don't think it gives you the answer maybe that you want, but I think the earlier you can join, the better, because there's so much to understand and you have the time to do it. And you can make an informed judgment about when you want to step up and do more. Mm. Well, no, I think that's, that is fair enough because it is, as I said, there's no correct answer because it depends on the individual. But I think you've given a, a good uh, summary of the things that one should consider yeah. before joining. Yeah. So, um, time is money. What is the costs relating to membership, in, including the regalia? Okay, in terms of costs, there are three parts. One is um, what you would pay to the chapter in terms of dues for Supreme Grand Chapter, um, Provincial Grand Chapter. Um, Similar to craft. Exactly the same as craft, and also to the centre where you hold your meetings. Uh, in addition, there will be uh, the running costs of the chapter, the secretarial expenses and so on, um, which is all rolled into your subscription. Second part is dining, and most chapters will dine after their meeting in exactly the same way as Craft does. Some chapters will roll the cost of dining into their subscription, and others will charge it separately. And the third cost is regalia, and on FAB's website, they, are, um, they have two qualities, uh, one is 70 and one is 93, um, whichever one you choose. Um, when you get to the chairs, you'll have to change your regalia. And again, if you buy the whole lot again, uh, the cost is a little bit dearer. Uh, the top quality one is just over £100, and the other is, I forget, about £90, something like that. Um, to give you an idea, obviously you're only meeting three times a year, but if I said I've just renewed my subscriptions and I looked at the last ones I paid, um, the cost of renewing chapter was £180 and the cost of renewing lodge was £320. Mm. So proportionate. Indeed. How much um, ritual is there to learn? Well, there is some. Uh, it's a bit like craft. There's more to learn in the chairs, as, as you would expect. Um, there is one office that has a fabulous piece of ritual, but it's quite long. And I know some like to do it all, but it's quite a big ask. And I know a lot of chapters uh, where they will split that work between three people. So it becomes much more manageable. But there's still is ritual to learn. Um, and it's predominantly, as I say, the three chairs. Uh, but it's more, I think, a, a story, um, so it's a little bit easier to learn, I think, in my, in my eyes. Mm. Uh, who, who joins? What, what sort of mason joins the Royal Arch? Um, and I suppose I have to ask, does it help um, a craft mason's career? Oh, gosh. Um, why do they join? It's because they understand that the journey is not just the three degrees of craft masonry, but this is a completion of that journey. Uh, they understand that in the third degree, 
Um, you're invited to contemplate on your inevitable destiny. And therefore, the Royal Arch takes you in that journey and becomes a little bit more spiritual in its thinking. Um, it's a fascinating story, so there are lots of reasons why people would join. And those who want to read the last two pages of the book, you know, or the last two chapters. As to whether it helps you in craft mastery, you're asking the wrong person. Um, it's nothing to do with me. But I mean, I do like to think that Royal Arch is voluntary, it isn't compulsory. And therefore, I would expect Middlesex to accept that this is a member's choice not to join or to join Royal Arch Masonry, um, and therefore it would make no difference whatsoever. I, I think that you've answered a lot of this, uh, of this question, which is how are the two orders, Craft and Royal Arch, connected? Um, and what is it about? But have you got anything specific to add to what you generalised on? No, it, it's, it's, it's parallel tracks, isn't it? The, the, the craft works um, on three levels. You have lodges that belong to a province that is governed by UGLE. Uh, in chapter, uh, private chapters belong to a provincial grand chapter, uh, which in turn is governed by Supreme Grand Chapter. And the people at the top are the same. Uh, you know, the head of the Supreme Grand Chapter is His Royal Highness Duke of Kent. So, um, and the head of Craft is also him. So. Yeah, and but the head of Middlesex is that the same? Um, not quite, because we have the Prince of the Blood Royal as our provincial Grand Master. Um, Prince Michael of Kent and Peter Baker is the pro provincial Grand Master. But with that one exception, it won't come as too big a surprise that Peter is also the uh, Grand Superintendent uh, in, in Chapter. So, um, and are there other um, offices which are shared, same craft? Secretary and Treasurer would be the classic examples where that happens. And Director of Ceremonies, presumably. Well, we don't like to mention him. <laughs> you can publish that one if you want. <laughs> I was trying to keep him out of it. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> oh, in fairness, Jim and I really get on. We were both appointed as um, provincial deputies in uh, directors of ceremonies in craft. Uh, Jim, 15 seconds before me. And we just drew from each other our, our experiences uh, if we had questions with sound each other out and we have gone on a, a tremendous journey together um, and the fact that we are where we are is i think a testament to how we love masonry both of us and how we interact with each other um, so we do take the mickey a lot out of each other. Um, Adhering to the, uh, to the to the adage that masonry is fun. <laughs> yes, which is nice to hear. <laughs> Tell me when when someone joins, uh, will the candidates know anybody in the chapter other than their proposer and seconder? And once again, I'm I'm sure. I'm generalising them. Um, the answer is they probably would because every chapter is attached to a lodge. So it's quite likely that many members of a lodge will join the chapter that's associated with that lodge. Um, if for some reason the lodge hasn't got a chapter, it's quite likely that they would be the members of that lodge would join another chapter, more than one would have joined. You go with your friends, don't you? Um, and it's possible that even in those circumstances, you will still know a lot of people in that, that meeting. Maybe not as many as if it was your own chapter um, attached to the lodge. And if for some reason you find yourself in a position where you are joining a chapter and you do only know your proposer and seconder, their duty is to in introduce you to the other members. And I think the members would be more than happy 
to welcome you into the fold because you are a new member to them. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about who you know. I think you know more than perhaps you give credit to it. And if you don't, go and ask somebody their name and have a chat. You know, it's, it's a friendly old organisation. It's a little bit more relaxed than, than Craft. Lovely, thank you very much for all of your answers. I don't know if there are any help. <laughs> I hope I've managed to get across to the members of Middlesex the ethos of the Royal Arch, and I hope it was of interest. And the Royal Arch is of greater interest to those who are not members yet. I really hope that you and I get the opportunity to meet in person. Um, preferably at a Royal Arch meeting and if not somewhere else once we manage to get back together. In the meantime, I wish you well. <laughs>